this is, this is a, a great, this is a day of metaphors. I mean, I, I'm looking at this. Here we are talking about an overlooked, you know, sort of a, uh, something that doesn't get the proper attention it deserves. And what a perfect way to symbolize that than to have, what is this, CMA, fanfare, whatever it is? I mean, you, you know, the, um, the corporate music du jour gets huge, huge accolades and attention, and we're kind of in the corner. We're going to, we're going to emerge from that. In, in fact, that's not the case. Uh, my friend David said, you know, perfect. You don't have to have a, you don't have to have a PowerPoint presentation because you got this. This is the PowerPoint presentation today. I, I wanted to go into a couple of. I, I, I ramble, ramble because I'm too lazy to have prepared anything. <laughs> I figure I can get pretty close to where I'd sit anyway. First of all, this organization, uh, Paul Sloan and Michaela, uh, thank you all for doing this. Uh, the, what you have, what you're trying to accomplish in cleaning up the, the river and getting that water good and pure would have been near and near the hearts of the people who founded this. And Cumberland is uh, you know, why we're, we're all here in a, in a lot of ways and why the people came here in the first place. There's no river, no anything. It's, it all starts with the river, you know, in country music, it all starts with a song. Well, in this case, it, it all starts with the river. I, I, I was thinking about this, and I was <clears throat> walking around yesterday, thinking, what am I, what, how do I want to say this? And I thought, I, I, we, the first two lectures covered some pretty interesting ground. Uh, Chris Ray and David Britton, and those, about half of you saw them. And some of them were pretty, in, in pretty uh, engaging stuff. Chris Ray talked about basically how, you know, you had the Native Americans who were here, and then you had the British and the French contesting for their, for the, you know, all the benefits of, of European control, which, bear, which really in the early 1700s got down to slaves, the Native American slaves, and, and fur, and basically a collision between two corporations <laughs> that culminated in the French and Indian War, I mean, two mega corporations. Uh, and that's that, and how and how the French lick, you know, where we are was was really the place where everything went through. This was a, this was such a, a, a crossroads, and uh, it, it still is, but it was back then. It's been it's, it's been a hugely important geographical location for a long time, a lot longer than even before the days of James Robertson and John Donaldson. So that's that's a pretty compelling beginning. And then David Britton went ahead a little bit and talked about sort of the national identity of people who were here. They weren't all locked in, waving the flag. They were, they were up for grabs after, after the eastern states had, uh, had sort of sold them out. And they, they said, we'll trade you free navigation of the Cumberland River, but let us have free trade on the Atlantic. And so New England did very well, thank you very much, and the West did terribly. And that, that sort of caused a problem. But David, so David talked about, the, both of those guys helped not dumb down things. But how, 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 it's like, there's a whole lot of issues here, a lot of scholarship, a lot of nuance. It's really worth knowing about. Um, so that's that's sort of what I want to do is sort of take it from a, well, I just want to have one disclaimer. What happened here and what I'm going to be talking about is it's, it, it, there was a time where it was all the lurking savages were the bad guys and the intrepid pioneers were the good guys. And it was a, it was, you know, it was very black and white really not that simple and I think the, uh, the way I like to look at it is a collision of two cultures and it, there was a certain inevitability about the way it was going to turn out and you have folks and I'm, I'm probably in a lot of ways and of course my dear wife and children they have, they have Cherokee ancestry and so I couldn't totally dismiss that but but it's it's really a cultural collision thing and, 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 and I don't know if it could there are people who want to say well it's, it was unfair. These native people were here, and they should have been left alone. Well, that, that's just, I don't see how that's possibly going to ever happen when you've got a huge population pressure coming from Europe and who want land, who, who understand how to, to grow crops, and they're farmers, and they're going to, and, and, and the 17, you know, the 18th century mentality is not going to say, oh, this is not fair. We'll just go, we'll stay here and starve, but you all go ahead and, 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 and you have hundreds of thousands of acres to do your hunting. And, There'll, there'll be a nice museum piece for it's just it's just not it's just not reasonable to think that would have happened. So I don't know how it could have happened. Looking back at it, I don't know if it could have happened any other way but this cultural collision. 
and, and it turned out that the side that won would have always won, and, and it was done poorly and, and hypocritically a lot of times, especially with, when you see the early, the early contracts between the king of Spain and, the, and, his, and, and, and Hernando de Soto, or you see the, or the, the, the British king and his various um, powerful lords, and they say, make sure in the name of the Lord that we do the, say, the, the greatest one is really the Spanish, when you say, you know, every time you kill somebody, if you take his, 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 his gold and jewels, we get a third. Every time you ransom somebody, we get a half. And they had all, and then by all means, though, in the name of the Lord, we'll, we want to make sure that these souls are, are saved. It's like, you know, so you see, you know, it's, it's very interesting to read. Now, let me get to the, cut to the chase a little bit. Um, the mentality of the people who came here, I mean, all, all, all of us had people who came from somewhere else. I mean, I see a lot of, a lot of folks here who know a lot about their, their ancestry and different times they made the transatlantic crossing. I mean, if you happen to have an African-American background that was made, you know, from Africa, then everybody's sort of a, a mix. But at some point, your early, your early ancestors came from wherever, France, England, Germany, and they, and, and people sort of do a shorthand and they say, well, you know, that's, that's the way that was. And they came to America, well, what does that mean? It means they, they, they sold everything they had Everything they owned was going to come with them. There was no going back. They were never going to go back. And the people they left that they loved, never going to see them again. Places that they, that they felt connected to, never going to go to those places again. Go to this whole new place and start. And they did that. Sometimes it was one generation before they made the next leap. And sometimes it was five or six. But they came west. Now, I'm kind of trying to get to the point that here your ancestors are, whether it's Pennsylvania or Delaware, or down to South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia. At some point, they're there, and they're 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 going to be faced with coming across the mountains to to um, where, where we are right now. And I, and, and you can't. I, I, this is this is we're going to talk about D-Day a little bit more, which is we all know the 70th anniversary of it's tomorrow and the greatest generation. And I'm, I'm saying they. they if it's the greatest generation, they probably got to share the building with the generation that did what, what we're going to be talking about, who came across the mountains and um, and settled this area, because they it was hard. I mean, they they, they risked everything. It's, 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 so we'll talk about the James Robertson era and all these people besides Robertson, the Buchanan parties and the Williams parties and all these people that said we're going to come, we're going to cross the mountains, or we're going to we're already in East Tennessee, we're coming. It, it really focus. I want to probably focus since we were talking about the Crumlin so much on just getting here for the for the Donaldson party and Charlotte Robertson's on that group. Some people here are probably descended from her. Uh, you got you're going to go a thousand miles. You're going to start off in the worst winter that, that, that on record where the, the wild animals didn't survive and, every, and when the thaw happened in early 1780, there were buffalo carcasses filling up the Holston and the Tennessee River because they didn't survive the winter. They got washed in. Just a totally hellacious thing. Now, what I want to do is put yourself in their position. You've got all your goods that you've had. You've sold whatever land you had if you could sell it. You know, you've got everything you've got in your little boat or it's, you know, it's coming different ways. And, and you're going to go a thousand miles and you're going to go through a territory that, is, that you didn't know how hostile it was but you're fixing to find out finally get there. You have people killed along the way, die along the way. You're running out of food. You get to the mouth of the, of the, of the Ohio River, the Tennessee River on Ohio. Ohio is flood stage. You're in these boats that are not made for going upstream. You gotta go upstream and get to the mouth of the Cumberland, which you don't even know where it is. And most, uh, several of them just couldn't do it. They, they just didn't have the, the, the manpower and woman power to, to get up there. But, but some of them make it, as you know, of course, John Johnson's adventure makes it, and Charlotte Robertson's having to row in her, you know, heavy, 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 her, her slave woman Hager row, and they're just exhausted, and they don't have enough food. They finally get there, and that's an ordeal. Now they got to go 214 more miles, or whatever the actual mileage is. Oh, go, think about going upriver 214 miles when you're already exhausted. They did it, and they get here, and they get, you know, and, and that that. Robertson, most of them settled not here. They settled at Freeland Station, which is where the Worthing Lodge is, you know, where, where Worthing Bag used to be. And they're there. And things are looking pretty good. 
and, and this one of the D-Day one of the D-Day um, analogies is that you know 70 years ago tomorrow this beachhead is established in Europe and it didn't they Eisenhower didn't know it would work or not. It was, it was up for grabs. If it hadn't worked, we'll talk, we're going to come back and talk about that. But same thing here. This is a beachhead in the wilderness for this particular cultural religion, and they're, and they're here. And things look pretty good at first. They got really 1,500 people, I'm guessing, about the right number, who, who come here in the spring of 1780, and they do the Cumberland Compact, uh, there, which the, and this is this organization's name. And um, they are in eight population centers. And, Tax. There's some. There's some attacks, but they're not. They're not really a, a total consequence yet. And uh, it's it's important to note, by the way, that the there was this isn't like Wounded Knee. There weren't. There, some people still think there were there were there weren't villages along the Cumberland who were getting displaced and forced out. They, this was a, a basically a no man's land, and nobody was allowed, had been allowed to settle here, including the Shawnee who tried in about 1670 or so. Um, and finally they ran afoul of the Cherokee and the Chickasaw and they got driven out. And so here come these whites and they're, and I'm sure in some native minds, they're just another tribe who's in the way because they want this, they don't want, no, nobody's gonna be allowed to be here. So the attacks start and, and this is kind of fast forwarding, but it just gets brutal. These people thought, you know, nobody's living here, we'll probably be okay. And there's a lot of upheaval. I mean, the, the British are in the process of losing in the Revolutionary War things are starting to turn toward against them and I think they say they saw this opportunity we got to go do it now go, so they came and uh, then the attacks the, Brit, the British helped uh, sort of foment that but a lot of them were, were creeks and the creeks were not never had a claim of land north of the Tennessee River uh, so they, they were their homeland was down you know the Montgomery Alabama area in, 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 in central Alabama but they came because this is this is really a way to but to, I guess, please their, their, their European arms dealers, <laughs> the British, and also to collect scalps, which is a way that young men uh, made a uh, real name for themselves within their tribes, and also as hunters, those two ways. So it was, a, it was hard to get folks to come up here if you, if you paid, paid them to come. So the thing started. Now, I'm gonna sort of slow it down a little, and I've talked, I, I, if I'm talking too fast, I go, somebody go, Mary, you can kind of go, slow down. Like I get keyed up to tell this story. She's already doing it, so I slow down. <laughs> um, so here's Robertson, and here's, here's his group, and they're at Freeland Station. And Robertson's doing everything he can to keep, keep this place alive because things have, got, have started getting really bad. Through that first year, I think there's around 70 deaths, and 70 deaths might think, yeah, that's not so much, but it is it's a lot when you don't have many people to start out with. And what it, what it really meant was that they're saying, how do we go out and support our families? The only way we can do it is through hunting and through planting. And we can't go in the woods and hunt safely because the killings, there are people out there who are waiting for us to do that so they can kill us. And we really can't go out and clear ground because it takes, we're vulnerable. Everybody sort of sees that with this with this level of hostility, we can't we can't make it. So people start leaving, and it goes it goes um, south in a hurry. And and people start having those fears. Then the fear then the attacks are worse and worse and worse. And finally, they're down those eight population centers that are mentioned in the Cumberland River Compact get down to three. And then Casper Mansker's station is down to two. And that 1,500 people, the ones that aren't killed, probably 150 of them stay here and everybody else is leaving who can leave. Some people can't leave. They can't, it gets to where you can't even go out into the woods to, to make, to cut trees down, to build craft, to take you the heck away from here and go down River and Natchez. They're just, they're stuck. Robertson's, and, and, and I'm not even giving, beginning to give him fair credit because I, I think he's, I don't think there's better, a better uh, leader in the history of the nation than James Robertson. I just don't, I don't, I don't see it. You look at everything that happened to him, everything he did before he even got here. It's just, it's, a, it's, it's, an, epic, it's an epic story. And uh, he hasn't gotten his due. I mean, just in a, again, the high points are that he 
risked his life so many times. You can't can count him. He got wounded three times himself. He had two children killed. One was 12 years old. Basically, he was hit on his pole out in front of his station, and he kept on going. He was just this tough, resolute man. And um, I, I, you know, I, if somebody says, do you want to be George Washington in your next life or James Robertson? Let me be Washington. I don't want to be a Robertson. And they, his wife, Charlotte, was asked to spend her life, you know, would she go through it again? She said, not for any, if you got her entire world given to me, I would not go through that again. It wasn't worth it. But he was just a heroic guy, and he kept the settlements together. So this brings us, and I'm getting to the Battle of Bluff, but I'm just trying to give you a little running start. So he's up, he, he is in Freeland Station, Wentz attacked on um, January 15th, 1781, and he leads the defense, and they, they manage to hang on barely. Two people are killed, including his slave Cornelius, who was the first African American to come to this, this area. And, um, and they figure out pretty quickly after this, they, their horses are killed, they're, they're, they're vulnerable, and they say, we can't defend this position. The Bluff Station, you know, Fritz Lick Station, Fort Nashboro, what we called it later on, that's the, that's the place we're going to have to make our stand. So, the, they, so they, they all go, and a day or two after the middle of January, they get on their horses, if they have them, and they run, and they're under fire as, they're, as they cross the French Lick Branch, and uh, they, they, they make it into this station, which is still being still being improved, it's, it's, not, it's not really ready yet. Uh, and there they are. And the attacks keep coming. Uh, there, are 40, there are 40 people able to fire guns, and 40, 40 men who are, who are martially uh, prepared to, to fight in that fort. But seven of them go off after horses to steal the horses back that were stolen from them down around Chattanooga. Uh, David Hood, the famous person people have heard of, who was scalped twice in one day, playing dead. You know, imagine getting scalped and not even going. <laughs> That's what he did. And then having your neck attempt two attempts made to dislocate your neck with stomps. And not, he was an injured person. There were there were there were a lot of injured people in that in that in that fort. And they really so that the morning of April second. 1781 is where we're, we're really coming to talk about it. And what I want to, of course, the, the, this beautiful sycamore tree <laughs> obscures the vision of exactly where the fort was. And I, I made some little handouts that are on your desk and they're rough. That's kind of what, that's what you get to go for. It, it's sort of the, the description of people who were either there or who talked to people who were there, what the fort was like, and then why we know where it is because of two different people who were there said, here's where it was. And it's kind of, I won't go into the historiography of it, but I have no question about where it exactly was. Now, where the, you all are all familiar with the, with the site of the fort, uh, the replica. Of course, it didn't look like the replica, which is okay, and it was bigger than the replica. But where the fort actually was was just on the courthouse side of that replica. The, the south wall of the actual structure was at the was where the north wall of the replica is. So, it, so there's a little park there. So thank, thanks be to the to the history god because it hadn't been developed. Most of the fort is still. You can go out there and walk and stand in the place where these things I'm about to tell you about happened. And I uh, and I think it's enormously compelling uh, what happened. So on, on that morning on the second of, of April, and I, I need you know we're right. I mean I, if you can't. You, it's really just trust me. Just look through that, look through that sycamore tree. And that's where we're talking about where the fort was. And if you later on, when you want to, go up to that little park, and you'll be standing right in the middle where this happened. Um, the the there's probably at that point probably 28 folks in there who can actually use a firearm effectively. And uh, that morning, the women are out milking, and a couple other folks are out, and they get fired on, and they. People who fire them are not running away; they're over there mocking them. And actually, there's one account where they, one of them, lifts his loincloth and slaps himself on his hands. You know, which I guess was a late 18th century Mooney uh, kind of a deal. And uh, they were being mocked, and they they had learned sort of the 
sort of like the way the Israelis, you gotta respond to any kind of a challenge, you gotta go after them. So they said, we gotta go after these people and run them, and run them down. But James Robertson was involved in, uh, he was so, so prescient and knowledgeable. He said, this looks like an ambush to me. And they'd already been talking about, they, they figured there was a home base somewhere in the immediate area because all these attacks are being launched. They said, they can't be going 200 miles and, to make one up, it's gotta be a home base. And we, they'd already had been discussing going out and trying to find them and just launching a preemptive attack and see if they could you know, eliminate this problem. So Robert said, this isn't, this isn't what we need to be doing, this is an ambush. But a guy named James Leeper, uh, who I, I know one of his descendants, and acknowledges his, his ancestors' shortcoming in this regard, James Leeper, um, said, you know, Robertson is kind of losing his nerve. We need to go out and chastise these people. And, and so Robertson heard that his integrity, his, his courage was being questioned, and he said, I can't, I'm the guy, I'm the leader here. If, if everybody thinks I'm losing my nerve, the little bitty the, the, the hold I've got on people and keeping them here goes away. And so he went to Leaper, and we can go exactly to where, they, where this happened. Because of, you can see on that, Rough, that, those rough notes. <clears throat> James Roberts and Leeper lived next door to each other, right at the corner of that park, right at the intersection where First Avenue and, and Church Street come together. And, I, I, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, but I'm, I'm anticipating a nice big plaque in the ground. You were standing here. Here's what happened on that morning. And he confronted Leeper. He said, look, I'll, I'll put it to the test. I'm just telling you that this is a mistake. So they met, 20 of them mounted up they mounted up right there on the other side of the sycamore tree. And, and for those of you who are looking through the wreckage of the, whatever this modern art thing is with the, the roller coaster rails and all that, right past there all this happened. They, 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 they got on their horses and they, they rode out in the south part of the gate, rode right down Front Street. There was a small, a small path that went through. They had cleared out the area around the fort uh, to the, to the, to the uh, distance that an Indian gun could fire, so they, they had least coverage. But then the forest started, uh, and they, they came all the way down across where Broad is now, and they came to where Wilson's, what was later called Wilson's Spring Branch is. And if you look over there, you can see a great a culvert coming out into the river, and that's Wilson's Spring Branch. That's where the, 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 the ambush took place, but not right there, over probably around second or third in Dumumbrian is where they were spread out, but, but and it, it winds right up through there. But that's, 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 that's how far they went. And they ran into 250 Creek Indians. Uh, and now I can stop a second for just a, why do we know all this now? Why don't we all know this already? Because some of you know, knew Oscar Noel. Dr. Noel, his wife uh, had a, her mother had possession of a school some very old papers and her mother had died in 1949 and they'd stayed in this trunk in Memphis, Tennessee until 1980 and they finally looked at them and said this is probably ought to go to the State Library and Archives, Artistic Historical Commission, Society got them actually. And, uh, and they, nobody really interpreted them and then I, I finally got a hold of them and I saw I kind of knew what they were. Now, this is a whole different, this isn't all this stuff in Washington and Hayward, this is some new stuff. Because the things that everybody's got wrong, this got right. So it gives you a whole different view, of a, the final view of, of what really happened. And Edward Swanson, and my friend Rick and I went to his grave site yesterday morning. Uh, he's the one who was responsible for, for preserving information. So Swanson said there were 250 creeks, and they were right there on the other side of Wilson Branch, hiding in the underbrush, and they raised up, and, and the whites, 20 whites fired and took off. Well, the first fire, the, the horses all left them. The horses skedaddled back to the fort, right up here. This, this happened right, you know, let's say quarter of a mile or less from, from the river right there is where, where the event, where the ambush took place, and the whites are gonna have to go back from there all the way back to there, which is whatever that is, half a mile, maybe not even that much. but. Next, big problem number two was another 250 or so creeks were about where Fourth and Commerce is, and they had come in behind the 20 who were out to cut them off. Now, 
and this is something that nobody, I haven't said this in a talk yet, you haven't been bored by my previous talks. A guy named Louis Milford was a French sort of a soldier of fortune. He came to America right before the revolution. He ended up, he didn't like Americans. He heard about how terrible the Native Americans were. He went to, to, to the Creek homeland and found them charming. He loved them and he ended up becoming their war chief. And he introduced them to European warfare techniques. And I had, I, he, wrote, he, he wrote a book called Memoirs and then a lot of other verbiage after that. And he, he didn't say, I was at, 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 at the French Lick when we almost took the thing. He didn't say that, but he left some stuff out. And this has every, his fingerprints are all over this. He was there at the time. He was the war chief at the time. That was a very European move to make. So I have a feeling Milford was behind this, and I can't prove this. I didn't put it in the book, but it's sort of by, it's just suggested. So, so in this moment in time where you got these 20 guys, and they've got 250 creeks there and 250 creeks about right there, about where Broadway is, and they gotta, they got to figure out how to get back. And if they don't, as I'll say in a little while, the, uh, the uh, world's a different world than we have now probably every way. So how did they get back? Well, the first thing was the horses. The horses were a big prize. And, I, and, and another thing I guess I should say about the creek force, the 500 creeks that were there, some of them were probably long for the ride. They were probably not that hostile. One thing that they all had, they were all like jihadis, you know, going out to, to, to lay away. Some of them were probably kind of, well, I wonder what's going to happen now. So I don't know. But the horses were a big draw for them, particularly for somebody who didn't want to it wasn't a warrior, but they were there. They went after those horses. The horses ran into the fort, into the fort, and the gates of the fort were open. They ran around in there once, and all but one of them ran back out because nobody thought to close the gate. So, but, and, and that's bad for the people who owned the horses, but it's good for the folks that were caught out between the groups because some of those people who had, who had cut off the retreat went, hey, let's go some horses, let's go get them. Well, yeah, I want, I'd rather a horse than a scout, which I might, uh, who knows what they're. Everybody has their own thoughts about that. But that's the first thing. Second thing was the dogs. They, they had ferocious dogs. Dogs made it possible to survive on the frontier. Uh, they, and the, now these were not just regular. These weren't uh, fluffy and <laughs> pogo. These were big bear dogs, bear, dogs that would hunt bears. And so they, they were trained to go after Indians, and, and they did. Now, whether Charlotte let them out, that whole, that whole thing about the Charlotte Roberts and the dogs out, maybe she did. Nobody said she did until years after, until 80 or 90 years later, somebody finally said, I think Charlotte let them out. But the people who were there, nobody said Charlotte let them out. So maybe she did, but she didn't need any extra credit. She was such a hero anyway. It doesn't matter whether she did or not. not. So those are, but then there were, the reinforcements arrived, the mighty reinforcements from the fort, which consisted probably of five guys. Uh, and they came out to try to, to try to do that. But between those three different um, events, there was enough of a of a gap open in the in the in the ranks of the creek to get through for some of them. Now, six of them ended up dying. Two of them, two of them didn't make it back. Uh, Peter Gill, uh, probably not Ken events, but who knows? He died right down there with all that teeming mass of of soon to be drunken people are <laughs> gathering. <laughs> That's where he died. Uh, another guy was, was George Kennedy. But four, four people made it back who were mortally wounded, and then two made it back who were less wounded, and then the others made it back, period. And, the, and they're all I mean, John Cockrell, who has, you know, who, who was the, the original owner of what's now Centennial Park, was one of them and who, who did that. But there was just a it, it was just amazing that anybody got back. Uh, so Isaac Lucas had been shot in the hip, and he was he, he was laid out within rifle range of the fort. He was getting shot from the fort. People were shooting the Indians, but they were hitting Isaac Lucas. Uh, and then an Indian came and tried to, to scalp him, and he had never fired his gun. And the Indian gave him a big smile and advanced on him and got, got killed. And then, then there was a big war between the, the Indian body recovery parties trying to get the, their fallen comrade and, and it was just that was chaos. Zachariah White, one of the one of the five one of the five or so reinforcements from the fort, he got about four steps out of the fort and he got shot in the in the gut and which meant if your bowel was perforated you were not going to live at that time. And Alexander Buchanan came in, he'd been gut shot. 
And James Leaper, the guy who started it all, he'd been shot up enough, but not there. And they, around sundown, the, the, the Alexander McCann died, and, and, uh, and um, who's the other one? I can't think of it down for a couple of minutes. Uh, it, it was just a mess, because this was, this was a third of your fighting force is, is dead or about to be dead. And why didn't the Indians just do the, like the Mexicans at the, at the Alamo? That's just not the way they waged war. They really, they really um, were in trouble with their people at home if they were sloppy about losing lives. They, they, cared, they were much less willing to give up their lives than, than some of the, you know, for theological reasons, who knows all the reasons, but they just didn't go over the walls. That's, that's not how they did it. They'd rather take one, one life and lose none than take 100 lives and lose two. That's just the way they, their calculus worked. So once they got back in the fort, that was a, a good thing. Casper, I gotta say this, Casper Mansker was one of the wounded ones. And in 1980, I got to go out and see Mr. Claude Garrett in Billingsville. And he said, wanna see Casper Mansker's teeth? <laughs> and I said, boy, I sure do. So he, got, he had a little tin, uh, David told me to say this before, and he had his mowers in there. He, he, he was an undertaker and they'd move the body and he kept this little souvenir. So actually I got to see the, the teeth of somebody who was who was wounded, but the, and who was much more than that. I mean, Mansker was just a, an incredible frontier figure. But I just took it, it, it does something for me to be able to say this is real. This isn't this isn't conjecture. So Mansker gets back. Um, they they make it. They they survive. There's a siege for a couple of days, but it doesn't go anywhere. So they they by the skin of their teeth, the Bluff Station hangs on. Eaton Station, which was really really weak down the river. It was not attacked, it, it hung on. So you had this little beachhead, a little fragile beachhead that's still, that, that's still intact. And not many folks came here after that for obvious reasons until probably 1784. Uh, it start, the population starts coming back a little bit, but it's not what it was. And now people thought they were gonna come here and claim their land, clear their fields, build their houses, and be off to the races. It just didn't work that way because of the resistance. Uh, now, what I, what I really always want to focus on is the back to the D-Day reference. Um, Eisenhower thought it was, uh, I talked to some World War II historian and friends of mine, they said he thought it was about a 50-50 deal whether, we could, whether the Allies would hold the beaches of Normandy. And he already had written his apology, basically it's, it's my fault that this failed, because it didn't fail. But it, it, it was questionable. If it hadn't, if it hadn't worked, um, what would have happened? Russia was just, just destroying the Germany on the, on the Eastern Front. And the thought is, if, if America and, and allies hadn't held on to that beachhead, it would have been a, a, a Soviet Union would have looked a lot more formal than it actually turned out to be, which was formidable enough. <laughs> Thank you very much. And what would have happened, what would have happened in the wake of, you know, of a failed invasion? Well, we, uh, ultimately Hitler would have lost, but it would have taken a lot longer. And what would have happened when we get the bomb in 45? Do we use it there? What, I mean, this changes everything if that beachhead hadn't been held. Similarly, if this beachhead hadn't been held, what, what happens to America? Well, I mean, this falls, Eaton Station falls, it's all back to, back to ground zero. It's gonna take another attempt from somebody, another group that's gonna have to come at some point and, 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 and come west. By that time, you know, Spain was the ascendant was the ascendant power. They had time to get their act together, in my view, and looked at it in a lot of different ways. I don't see how Spain could have possibly not had a confederated Indian alliance to do its bidding very precisely. I think it would have been a really hard thing, thing to do to come here. I think most people would have probably done what David Britton suggested in the previous lecture. They'd probably join Spain. I mean, a lot of the southern United States would have been Spanish states with a whole different view, and it would just it would just ultimately, utterly altered the, the seedlings that became the Confederacy. I don't see how it would have been the same. Other things that wouldn't have been the same are, in my view, um, the, the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, you know, it wouldn't have been the same. It, it would, the calculus would be all off from that. I mean, America wouldn't have looked the way it looked. Andrew Jackson, no Battle of New Orleans, no Jackson presidency, no centralization of presidential powers during the Jackson administration. How's it all work? It's a big deal now. And so here we are in Nashville with this great story. And we're just now, thanks to Edward Swanson and 
and so all the other people who weighed in and who did it. We had this great story to tell, and this is where I lose my mind. This is where I, I try to go, what am I missing here? I, how is it that I, I've talked to two people who are very powerful in the local government, and I get, I say, this great thing, and it's like, nothing. You know, you know, it's like, really, this is really great. Nothing. We, we thought that it was going to be that the, that the Ford, and, and that David Curry has done a very nice job of, of, of planning this. The, the, the funds have been made available and have been, a lot of it's been spent on this plan. And the plan is to, and some people aren't wild about it, but I am, uh, to take the rel, just to get rid of what's there now, put up an interpretive center on the, on the site of, of, uh, of what's now Fort Nashboro. And, and say, get it, you know, get, get sort of get your juices flowing. Say, here's what's happened. Now let's go out into the park where this actually happened, and you can go stand where James Leeper and James Robertson had their disagreement. You can see where the SB house was. You can see where the it, we you can actually we'll be able to in very short. We don't lack much money to do this, but after having been assured that this money would be made available in this current budget, guess what? At the last minute, some you know, I know who, but I won't. Right. You know, uh, somebody said, well, I always think we're going to do something else with the money. Let me tell you, uh, this is what, the part that really makes me kind of, I don't know, think about a Donald Duck kind of a characterization of this, but we can find a million bucks to pay the producers of the soap opera Nashville to film here. We can, that, that, that's okay. We can find that money. We can, we're going to, please don't leave and film wherever the heck they're going to film, which is perhaps a real thing, maybe a bluff, but we can find a million bucks of that, but we can't finish the funding of this. We can, we, this last week, we had the, um, the, a convention of people who plan conventions here, and I think uh, the price tag on giving them the freebies at the convention center and all their gift bags was about a million five. We can find that, and said we, we can't find a way to tell our own story. Here's, the order. Here's what we got. We got a greenway that's coming through there that has one of the most important historic sites in America, and we can't tell our own story. It's just, to me, it's, I don't know which thing, whether insane, stupidity, which, which of the many things to do. It's like, well, I know it's gonna happen. I just don't have the, I'm, I'm easily to, I'm easy to ignore, apparently. And uh, some, some of you who aren't so easy to ignore, I should, you, I, I would urge you to go and ask your council person or your whoever, mayor or whoever you know, say, how do you, how do you defend this? How do you say that we have kids coming out, coming through our school system and we all like to talk about, we want to be, have the best education here in Nashville we can possibly have. How do you justify the fact that teachers are always looking for ways to engage their children and, and we have this story and they're coming out year after year after year not hearing the story. How's that? What, tell me, make, tell, tell me how you defend that. But we do have this soap opera that's going to be filmed here for one more year, maybe if we're lucky or half a year. We can't, but we can't do this. Uh, it just it, there's no reason whatsoever. And thinking about booking conventions, boy, how many people would love to come to the conventions go to Nashville and see this story told right? Like here, there's this place where America pivoted, just like it did at Gettysburg and New Orleans. It's because you hadn't heard of it doesn't mean it didn't happen. This, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. And uh, we got it. That's, that's the best of the challenge is just to get that story told. And, and it's great to sing Kumbaya to a politician who doesn't want to listen, but you know, it's time to maybe not sing Kumbaya and go, go, go whether it's petitions or whether it's going marching at the, watch, at the Ford site, saying it's time to get off your duff and get serious. I know you're not from here, but you know, let's take the time to learn the story and then we'll tell it. So that's my, that's my political thing, but I just, there's, please go to the park and experience it. And, and, and there's, there's, it, the narrative is much deeper than I have time to give it to you right now. But you can, I'm sure Paul Sloan would love to have you come back here and, and, and say, here's where all this happened. All this happened right there. That, that, yeah, there's a lot of people like there. There were a lot of creeks there uh, 200 and however many years ago, 34 years ago, probably more than that. But this, this is this is hell of ground here, I mean, everything changes. If, if, if it just things, the, the die got cast and uh, and things turned up well for the settlers, 
and, um, and, and if it hadn't, this, that's what you look for. Is it, what's the downside? What's the, how, how did things change? So, 